Welcome to Wealth Well Done. Together, we'll cover a wide range of important topics surrounding money and the impact it has on our lives. From the sophisticated and highly valuable planning techniques of the ultra wealthy to the commonly underutilized biblical teachings. Together, we'll work to improve our relationship with money and our effectiveness in stewarding it well. Here's your host, Eric Scoville. Welcome to the 13th episode of the Wealth Well Done podcast, where we go after the tactical, practical, and spiritual advice to help you do your wealth well done. Um, as always, we have the disclaimer here that says anything that we're talking about in the show is meant to be generic. And so take this advice, uh, apply this to your situation, work with your financial team to decide what does and does, uh, doesn't make sense for you. But um, here today, I'm so happy to have a uh, good friend, Jeff Miller, here for, for another episode. Last week, we went after the ways um, to help you get healthy with money on the individual level, which you brought up is is impossible until you get healthy you know, yourself first. You have to heal from the inside out, and then you can go after how to get healthy with money. And it's just, it's a, it's a thing that mo- most most people really struggle with and they don't even know that they're struggling with it. It's kind of this, this hidden, this deceptive one. Um, so thank you for what you did last week. This week here, we are going after the impact of money inside marriage. And so uh, Jeff Miller, for those of you who didn't listen last week, they were, uh, Jeff is the co-owner of Glen Manor Counseling in Peoria. He has been a uh, licensed therapist for almost 30 years. He has a third third generation farmer, or maybe more than three generations, and he's also the chairman of the elder board at Northwoods Community Church. So um, Jeff is is uh, very well suited to have this conversation, and he also has a perfect marriage. Which, <laughs> which Don't is, ask my wife that which question. Which is even better. So <laughs> so he's the perfect man to, to talk to us about this. Um, now, so we we know that in this. I'm going to say this country, um, but this is this is a worldwide issue. But let's just focus here on this country. We've screwed up marriage, just about every which way you you can look at it. We have screwed up marriage. You know, 50 percent of marriages fail. I don't know if that number has changed a little bit here in the last few years, but that's that's been the number that was around for a long time. Um, it seems like many of those failures have money somewhere near the core of the problem. Um, you know, top if, top two issues in all marriages: sex and money. Sex and money. Sex and money. Top two issues. Okay. So um, for this podcast, we're going to leave the sex. We don't have to leave it out of it, but we're going to focus on the money side here. Um, but you know, and, and what we discussed last week was that money may not be the real issue. That money is often maybe right. the symptom, or it's, it's what looks like the, um, it's what appears to be the issue here. But but there's probably something deeper. And so last week we we dug into that a little bit more. Um, it, when you look at marriage, mm-hmm. how much of it still is back to the core of what we talked about? Last week, where money's not the money's just a symptom. How much of that is? Oh, well, it's one hundred percent because it, money and wealth represent a issue of power. Okay. Okay. So money, who controls the money? Who's the spender? Who's the saver? Uh, who's blowing up the credit card? Who's paying the bills? Who's wrestling with how to get the debt covered? Those are all power related issues in the marital relationship, and so they 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 expose poor communication. They expose poor limits and boundaries. They expose all kinds of other problems that just get labeled as money problems. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, if you were to, if you were to lo- look at this, what is it? What's a man needing out of marriage? <laughs> well, you know, top top two needs that 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 men or the top need that men have is to be respected. Mm-hmm. The top need that women have is to be reassured that they are loved. Now you can think about how how would money play into that equation. So for the guy to feel respected, it would be thank me for all the money I earn and don't question how I spend it. Yeah. For the woman, it would be I want to know that we're okay. I want to know that we have a retirement plan. I want to know we can cover the expenses for the kids who going to college. I want to know that we can get them into the into little league and we've got enough money to do all that. So it's a different function for each partner, but we have to be aware of those functions and try to meet both of those sets of needs. That takes work. It doesn't just happen right. just because somebody goes to work and a paycheck comes home. Okay, so a man needs needs respect, mm-hmm. and as we talked about last week, often that might it, the 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 lie that we have there is that respect comes because I make a lot of money. Correct. So I make more than you if we're if I am competing against you, and you're mm-hmm. the you're the handsome guy who lives in the bigger house down the street, um, or you know you're the 
you're the brother-in-law or something else like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and you inside families, they have tons of that. Um, but so a man might think that his respect comes from, from he's going money. to earn that by right. having more money. Right. And so lie number one we have to figure out is respect doesn't come from there. Correct. Respect does not come from money. It comes from your integrity. It comes from your values, your morals, your ability to be depended on. It, it ultimately goes back to, you know, what is the role of a husband in a godly marital relationship? It is to protect to provide for, to nurture, to care for, to be selfless. It is all kinds of things that aren't related to just bringing in, you know, a six or seven figure income. It, 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 that, that's not what it's about. Yeah. Okay. So let's stick on the guy for a minute. How do I, as a, as the male inside of marriage, who's supposed to be the leader and the, the provider in this sense, how do I, um, maybe disconnect the this piece that, that I'm thinking that it's all about money to, to, to do that. Or if I if what I perceive from my spouse is that it's mainly money related, how do I how do I break that connection um, of that maybe that deception and get deeper into the into the root of this and get into real truth? Well again for many, many men, um, their sense of being successful is directly correlated to is my wife happy? Um, does she have everything she wants? Uh, does, do we look good from the street curb? You know, mm-hmm. does the appeal from the street curb look like we've done it all? And unfortunately, all that's empty because it's still going to leave those nagging issues that are happening behind closed doors that nobody sees. And, you know, my heart for the work I do is I want to get behind the closed doors and work on what the root issues are rather than work on just painting the facade and making it look good from the street corner. Because that's just a lie. Yeah. That that that's not what it's all about. And um, very few men are coached or encouraged or even challenged that their most greatest gift is a relational gift to the people that that they love. Men are men are are taught a lie. They they are they they believe a lie that my worth and my value is what I do, not who I am and my heart. And you know, so many men have have just walled off their hearts. They've numbed their hearts down. They they've shut their hearts off. Right. And it's such a disservice to themselves, to their loved ones, and ultimately to their relationships. Uh, and so, for a guy to begin to get back to a place where he recognizes that his worth and his value is not tied to the money that he earns, or the job that he has, or the title that he has, but it really is to who God made him to be as a provider, a protector a care person, a person who's modeling Christ's love for the church. That is not easy to do. That takes work and discipline and it takes intentionality because it's easy to go to work. I mean, really it is. It's right. easy to get in the car, drive to work, go put in 10 hours a day. It's hard to sit and to reflect and to review and to evaluate and to be vulnerable and to talk and to touch on things that are painful and to be present, yeah, and to feel, because we because we you and I aren't wired up that way, Eric. We're not wired up to just naturally feel. We're we're not wired up that way. Our wives are, but we're not. So, so you brought up something really good that most men would not consider one of their strengths to be relationships. No, maybe salesmen. Salesmen would, but they're going to think of their relationships in terms of business and sales. But mm-hmm. most men would never consider themselves to be good at relationships. And that's, that is another lie. That's not true. I, I am good at, I'm good at carpentry. I'm good mm-hmm. at blank, mm-hmm. but not, I am good at relationships. I am a great husband. Mm-hmm. You don't hear many guys say that. I'm a great husband. I'm a, no. I'm a great dad. No. I mean, I mean, if you did, if you did an icebreaker at an event with a bunch of guys, go around the room, tell us about yourself. Yeah, oh, my name's Bill and I, you know, I, I pour concrete or I'm Steve and I sell cars or I'm Phil and I do insurance. Not I'm Jeff, and I am a servant of Jesus Christ, skillfully disguised as a husband and a father. <laughs> okay, yeah. I, 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 now, I, I'm the first to admit, I'm not introducing myself that way. I, I didn't introduce you that way either, even okay. though I should have. But, yeah. but, but that's my heart. My heart is I want to be that. Yeah. I, I want to, because I know that's where eternal wealth, eternal value, eternal rewards are going to lie. 
the stuff that moth and rust does not destroy, the stuff that does not rust and go away. Right. So when we, um, when I was making my career jump, I had the 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 realization come to me because so I was offered it. I was offered a the, the next position up, and it was it would have been a fantastic promotion, and it seemed great. And I just had this thought of on my deathbed, I will not care about titles. I really won't care about what title I held in a, in a position in the, or in a company. It won't matter. And what will matter? Like, I want to be a phenomenal dad. I want to be a phenomenal father, and that takes time. Mm-hmm. And my hierarchy is God, spouse, kids. Mm -hmm. And so if I need time to be a great dad, I need time to be a great husband. You can't be a great husband by just being a provider. You have to, and with with financial means, you have to go be there. You have to do life with your wife. You have to support her. You have to, you have to just grow in that intimacy. And so I need time to be a great husband. I need time to be a, I I struggle to say being a great child of God's, um, uh, for some reason, I find it easier to say a great husband than a great child of God's. But in any ways, like the, being the best child of, of God's that I can possibly be. And it takes time. It takes time for all of that. So. Look, look, Eric, the, the, the number one problem, the number one challenge that we as men have is spending time connecting with our wives' hearts. Hmm. Okay? We can go to the grocery store with them. We can clean up the sticks in the yard. We can clean a closet with them. All of that is easier for us to do as men than it is to sit with them and hear their hearts. Yeah. And the irony is, is that the number one thing that our wives went from us is not more money in the checking account or more, you know, credit line on the credit card. What they really want is to know our hearts. And the only way they'll know our hearts is to have time and to create the environment to share and be vulnerable and communicate and connect. And that is so counterintuitive in the culture we live in today because way too much busyness. And second, these crazy little electronic devices that we're all holding constantly in our hands. And those things prevent intimate connection between husband and wife every day, every day, every day. And so maybe we get a snippet. Maybe if we're lucky. Maybe if we're lucky. And really, I mean, I've heard some stats that say if we're not giving like 90 minutes a week of just intimate, uninterrupted time with our spouse, well, we're not going to be connected. Yeah, 90 minutes a week is not much. 90 minutes a week is not much. But but honestly, if most couples laid out their schedules and their calendars with each other, honestly, to carve out 90 minutes from each other, I mean, dude, it's like, well, you know, we don't have it. Couples tell me all the time, we just don't have enough time. No, no, that's a lie. That would be one of those lies we've talked about. It is we're not prioritizing the right time in the right places because it's easier to prioritize it somewhere else. Right. Right. And so that's the that's the challenge for all of us. (laughs) Okay. So let's let's go back into the money side here. Mm -hmm. Um, So with money. Husband and wife often had two different upbringings around money. You have someone whose parents always, always, okay, always. So, so you've got, you've got, you know, that old opposites attract thing. Yeah, it's the right. same way with money. It, it, it is. One of you came from money. One of you didn't. One of you came from a healthy family. One of you didn't. It, it's the way it rolls. So every every time we went with a new client, I'm always asking them, you know, tell me about your your financial background and and, and how you're raised with money. What mm-hmm. what formed your earliest concepts of money? Are we mm-hmm. Are we stingy? Are we mm-hmm. are we uh, generous, generous and abundant, or are mm-hmm. we are we you know unwise with it because we just fearful we'll run out? And yes, um, so you have to you have to go back and understand. Then we we talked about that at, on the individual level last time. How do spouses come together with I'm this way and I'm this way, and how do we how do we find a healthy balance? <laughs> well, see, now you're making my case because the only way for that to happen is there has to be time to sure. intimately communicate, to share those things about each other. So now let's go to dating. When we're dating, we have no problem spending time together. Right. We have no problem snuggling on the couch and you know doing all the things that we do when we're in the dating process because we want to win. We want to get close to that person. It goes to a certain level of depth and then we decide we're going to get married. And then we let put rings on fingers and spend thirty thousand dollars and have a giant, uh, you know, event. And then we have to like do life together. Well, the first two years, which is the honeymoon period, that's just easy because we're just playing. But then it starts to get hard because now babies come, and now decisions come, 
And now sacrifices and prioritization come into the equation. And the only way we can get on the same page and have the same values about things like money is to have been sharing our hearts and come into agreement or into union or oneness about where we're going moving forward on topics of money, how we're going to spend, how we're going to budget. Where's where's our money going to go? Where's our money not going to go? And that takes time and energy. And most people don't do those conversations because they're risky. Because they create conflict. And most people are conflict averse, right. not, oh, let's go have a good conflicted conversation today. <laughs> Let, let's go, let's go to dinner and we're gonna have a good stimulating conversation about conflicted things. No. Let's go and talk about the kids. Let's go and talk about the weather. Let's talk about safe things because we don't really want to get vulnerable and intimate. Yeah. And we want the the fake intimacy, which is just yes. That. So let me, let's keep it cordial. Yes. And then I took you on a date, so let's go have sex. Yes. Sorry for being, you know, not politically correct. Um, but that, that, that's where, that's where so many of it. It's exactly where it is. That's I, reality. I have annoyed my wife so many times by those conflict uh, conversations, but they're worth it. I, I will tell you absolutely they are worth it because the, the fruit of it on the other side of the annoyance and the pain of the conflict is, is it's, inc- it's incredible once you have an understanding of each other and and that's where having having someone and and to anyone listening to this podcast you probably can't get jeff <laughs> jeff jeff is he he, he doesn't have he doesn't he's, off, have, he's off limits yeah jeff's off limits um it would have been great for you if you could but you need to find someone else who can help you facilitate those conversations who can help you yeah. uh through the conflicts and and so that's where that's where you know one one thing i hope you take out of this is is if, if you're having money issues or you're having issues inside your marriage and you think they point back to money, A, we need to go deeper. Yes. But, but then B, with that, just on the money side, like there's going to be compromise. There's going to be sacrifice. And it might feel one-sided that all it is is spouse A just wants to spend, spend, spend. And spouse B doesn't like that. Spouse B is the the one who's producing the... Either, either they're the ones who are trying to conserve to make sure we have enough for retirement yeah. or they are the ones who are trying to provide uh, either way. But there's going to be, someone has to lay themselves down first. Yes. But see, on both sides of that equation, there's a wound, okay? Sure. On the person who spends, spends, spending, they're spending because the spending is anesthetizing some place of fear and anxiety and discontent. Okay, so they're anesthetizing by having a dopamine drop because they bought something new because three Amazon boxes showed up on the front porch today. And so that, whoo, I got the excitement, the Amazon, the the, the dopamine drop while I go and open the Amazon box. Okay, but it goes away because it's short lived. It's like alcohol and pot and all other things are short lived. They don't last. The other side, the saver person, they're they're saving out of their own anxiety, their fear of the future, their fear of 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 not having enough, their fear of being unacceptable or rejected or out of control. And so both extremes in this money context are wound-based issues that have to be addressed and understood. They can't be avoided and one person can't just empower win because then the other first person will feel unheard, uncared for, and uh, as over time, resentment and bitterness will build. So let's facilitate that conversation for a minute because I am the husband or I am the wife and I sense that in you that you have that you've got this fear of the future and that's why we need to have so much or you are spending and I, I think you actually have an addiction to shopping and you might not rack up tons of credit card debt but you still i think you get some you know some release pleasure out, yeah pleasure yep. out of shopping that yep that's i can sense is unhealthy ah it's like going up and telling someone they've got a demon how do you how do you <laughs> how do you um initiate that conversation very simple okay this is what everybody who's listening with them understand very simple thing you just have to seek to understand first Mm -hmm. seek to understand first so the question would be tell me more or help me understand it's not you have a problem and you need to get some help because that immediately puts people into a defensive place. I say, you're right. That's great. Please help me. Yeah. That, but, but that doesn't facilitate intimacy or getting to the root of the problem. We get to the root of the problem because we, out of love and compassion for this person, we seek to understand first. We open ourselves up to wanting to understand, facilitating a safe space where they can vulnerably share what's genuinely behind those issues. Okay. And so we have to ask helpful questions without attacking criticizing, belittling, 
making assumptions, making statements. Those things just shut people down. And this all day. This happens that first conversation. Things. This is happening in every person who's listening's world everywhere. It's happening in their work world. It's happening in their, you know, with their in laws. It's happening with their kids. It's happening all the time. These are basic communication principles that we have to work through and get better at so we can have better outcomes in all of our relationships. Okay. But as it relates to this specific topic, it's super critical. And even if it takes you a year to work through this, imagine, so one year of painful conversations about money over and over and creating conflict. It will take at least a year. It isn't one dinner out conversation. It's not one night with the kids at in-laws so that you can have the whole night to talk. That It doesn't happen in one day. Yeah. You know, people didn't get to 40 years of age and have all this baggage overnight. We're not going to unpack it in one conversation. It takes time. But it's nothing, is ever, nothing is ever disclosed completely in one conversation. Also a good point. Okay. All right. So it's so worth it. Because we go back and we process things. And, and again, even the guy who's not a real emotional processor, he's still going to go back and he's going to process that conversation. And the next time we talk, some new things will come to the surface. Some new things can be shared and more understanding takes place. And we get closer. Not for, that, see, That's another lie, Eric, that, that through these conflicts, there's the fear of distance. Sure. When in reality, the conflict can, in fact, create the most intimacy we've ever had. You are, you're, you're a construction guy in your other life, right? Mm -hmm. So you know about welding, right? Yeah. So welding is this amazing analogy that I like to use. It's like, so we have two, pieces, two broken pieces of metal and we want to put them together. So we have two broken people in a marriage, we want to put them together. Well, no one would think we'd put them together by applying more heat. Right. But in applying heat, we create the weld, which the weld then becomes the strongest place. Right. When the metal re-breaks, it never breaks in the weld. It breaks on either side. But the weld is so strong because heat was applied. The analogy is, yes, it's, 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 it's emotionally difficult and challenging to have these conversations. But they create strength. Right. They create oneness. They create a bond that makes us strong for the future, for what's coming. And when our children see that, that again goes back to what I said in our last conversation. The greatest gift we give to our children is that mom and dad are okay. Right. When they see mom and dad work through conflicts and they see mom and dad getting stronger, they're just like, oh, they're at peace because they know they're going to be okay. On that note, real quick, so I completely agree. And I want to share this. This is something that uh, Bree and I have come up with for the way that we do conflict, because we have conflicts. We have a phenomenal Every marriage, couple but we has have conflicts. conflicts. But we've, we've laid some ground rules, and these may not apply to everyone, but mm -hmm. we've laid some ground rules that say, we don't call each other names, mm -hmm. we don't swear, we don't uh, hang up if we're on the phone or walk out if we're in a room, mm -hmm. we don't interrupt, mm -hmm. and the la we don't raise our voice. And we don't do that perfectly. I have still dropped an F-bomb in a, in a, yeah, in yeah, a, in a yeah. disagreement with her. Yeah. But for the most part, and she'll call me out saying, you're breaking the rules. Mm -hmm. And and she didn't like the rules at first. But now those rules have allowed us to have conflict type discussions. And we get to get to understand the point and not hear the blow up over here. And someone sneezed wrong. And so now we're going to go get upset about that and bring up something from three weeks ago there. Instead, we get to stay on point and, and get into the um, into the meat of the discussion. So, so let me affirm for you what your ground rules and what anybody who sets their own ground rules up, what that really does. What that says is this matters to me. This relationship is valuable and I'm not going away. Yeah. Cause remember everybody's greatest fear is being rejected and abandoned. Sure. Okay. So we put ground rules around challenging conversations. What we're really saying is this matters to me. I value it. I value you. And so I'm not going to leave. Well done. That's what couples and every couple needs to have their own ground rules. Yeah. They don't have to be as elaborate as yours. They could be just two or three points. But if there's no ground rules, then there's no safety. That's a good point. And we all need safety. All of us. A guy needs safety. Woman needs safety. Everybody needs safety. Okay. Switching gears or go, going to another topic here. Um, a lot of couples keep separate finances. No. And, and they do. And so I want to talk about the problem that that presents. Whether, whether spouse A and spouse B both earn the same amount of money or the very, most often it's a, it's a yeah. varying degree and sometimes a wide varying degree, whether you have a husband who 
makes a lot of money and gives his wife an allowance or any of these things. Like, can you talk about the the problems that are being caused? So that? the pitfall of siloed finances, her checking account, his checking account, her pot of gold, his pot of gold, however you want to frame it up. The, the, the conflict there, the problem there is, again, we're not doing oneness. Okay, the biblical context of marriage is to become one. We leave and we cleave. We leave away from our mother and our father and the two become one. So yeah, we become one sexually and intimately, but we're not really going to become one financially because I because back to what's the issue of money in marriage is about power and control. And so when we're keeping our money separate, I'm keeping this pot of power and control. I'm keeping this pot of power and control instead of I'm trusting you with my future and we're in this together and there's no out clause. We're going to make it happen. And so we're going to pool our money together and we're going to do it as a union, as a oneness entity moving forward. Yeah. And so when we keep it separate, ultimately, what I believe what couples are saying is we're preparing an out clause. We're, we're, preparing, we're, preparing, we're preparing to end. We're, 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 we're already implying there will be an end because I don't trust you enough to give you my finances and I don't trust you enough that we can work together to come up with an appropriate solution with how we manage it. Yeah. And, I, and I've seen some with their, their marriages, so I'd say are really strong. Mm-hmm. And I would say that in my perception that they might, I could never see them having, you know, exiting the marriage but I still think there's a lack of trust there there is. Is, as well that when they keep the separate finances that there's a lack of trust as well. It is. It's, it's, it's control. Yeah. Okay. It is not submission to one another. You know, again, submission is this big word that we, we toss around and, you know, women hate that term, but I'm just telling you a woman in a relationship where the man is in submission to the Holy spirit and in submission to her will have no problem submitting to him. Yeah. No problem. It's not an issue. But when she sees that he will go off and make decisions on his own that are selfish and not taking her and the children in the best interest, then she will have a hard time submitting because, again, she operates out of an emotional framework. She's fearful of being wounded or hurt or left behind. And money, of course, is the number one representation of that. Yeah. And so, obviously, it's it's not hard to draw the, the line then of how money can in, impact intimacy. Let's go there for a minute. You mentioned the two things, money and sex. Right and sex. So so if we can go after, so someone gets health, so someone's maybe got an intimacy problem. Mm-hmm. Let's let's un- unpack that a little bit here and figure out where, where they're at. And, and you've, you've mentioned that, uh, just go there. You've mentioned a lot of couples are not having sex. Oh, the, I, it's, it's amazing. In the, in the population of 30, 40 something year old couples that I work with, virtually all of them are struggling to have any kind of regular sexual intimacy. And so the question is, well, why? And again, it goes back to my wound, lie, vow, stronghold that we talked about you know, last week. But the issue is that there's something wounding that's preventing intimacy. The intimacy is not happening because I'm afraid, so I want to stay in control. Or I don't feel important, so I'm going to hold back and keep myself and, and stay safe. Because we're not doing that 90 minutes. We're, we're, you know, women don't want to have sex without being connected emotionally. It's yeah. just the truth. And there's no way for a guy to create emotional connection without time. Yeah. Foreplay is a heart issue far more than it's a genitalia issue. So if you, if you can do the emotional relational foreplay by having time, you, you, you put your, your wife in a position where she's willing to be intimate and close with you. But guys have to do that work. Guys want the sexual intimacy because they want some feelings that they're wrestling with to go away. They want the distraction of intimacy. But what the wife wants is to know what's going on distractedly inside of you and to share that stuff with her. And then she wants to be intimate with you. But when that doesn't happen, we have, we have, we have conflict. We have, we have pushing apart. We have, you know, avoidance. We have aversion. We have all kinds of distractions that prevent that intimacy from happening. So healing a marriage might require a lot of vulnerability of a guy who doesn't like being vulnerable. It will require it 100%. There is no way for a guy to have a healthy marriage if he's not willing to be vulnerable. He, He has to be. He has to be willing to cry. He has to be willing to be vulnerable. He has to be willing to share his fears. He has to be willing to be more 
real with his wife than anybody on planet Earth. And again, not to get in the weeds, but this is why people have affairs because they find a place to be sharing intimate things that's not the right place. Yeah. And that's what gets the ball rolling toward, you know, marriages falling apart. Yeah. The anatomy of an affair is not about sex. The anatomy of an affair is about needs not being met. Not sexual needs, emotional intimate needs. Yeah. Whew, all right. That's good. Thank you. Um, we got away from money there well, for we, a second. We did, but we? but I, it, I'm guessing there's not too many married people listening to this podcast who who don't agree that there's there's some meat there for them. Oh, yeah. That's resonating. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Back on the money side. Because again, money becomes a symptom of all those things. Correct. It, it absolutely does. So, yeah. you yeah. know, if, if, I, if, we're not, if we're not safe sexually, well, then I'm going to withhold money. I'm going to spend money. I mean, so it, they, they are directly related. Yeah. So you can't, if you've got a problem in one area, you're going to have a problem in the other. Yeah. yeah and, and that doesn't mean lack of money. You can, you can no. be on minimum wage and yeah. have the incredible intimacy yeah. with your wife if you, if you have done the healthy, you know, you've done the work to get healthy. It has nothing to do with the amount of money. It does not. Often, the more money, the harder it is, which is, is obviously very biblical as, he, mm -hmm. you know, as Jesus talks about so often. The problems Absolutely. With, with the rich, so. Because if I have more resources, if I have more money or wealth, then it's easy for me to think that I can go and take care of myself my own way. Right. Rather than I need the vulnerability of that intimacy with my partner and that no amount of money can solve that problem. Right. Okay. All right. Um, last topic that I want to do here is the uh, two career family. Yes. And so that's obviously become, it, it was something that was unheard of for a long time. It's mm -hmm. now probably, I would, I would venture to guess that that's the most prevalent um, scenario, uh, you know, in marriage today, at least in the, in the United States. So when you have two career focused people, especially when you have, when you've got two very talented people who, who feel called into their career, who feel good at it, who maybe are validated by the, by the success that they have in their career, how do you help? So obviously there are, there are some very common problems. You don't have to deny the fact that it's going to be harder on the kids. It's going to be harder on the family. You're going to have less time, those things. How, what are some of the hidden problems there that they might not recognize if they're in this, you know, if you have two very career focused spouses? Well, again, I would say that, that if you have two highly talented people who are working and doing well, mm -hmm. you probably have two type A people. Okay. And so type A people already start to see their worth and their value based on their performance, not on their ability to be intimate partners with one another. And so that becomes the first challenge. Their orientation or their worth is already in performance. Yeah. It's, it's look, look what degree I got in college. Look at the job I've got. Look at the salary I have. Look at the title I have. Look at the office I have. All of those things are masking a wound. Okay? Yep. They really are. They're masking yep. wounds. And so now we've got two people coming together who are wounded people and they have a lot of resources and we're going to go hard after something. We're going to go hard after the house, hard after the vacation home, hard after the family. But pretty soon, their needs as people start to boil up to the surface because all the stuff still isn't filling the void. It's not filling the need. Yeah. And there's no capacity now when you're a hard charger to slow down from being a hard charger and address those issues. So this is the challenge within the two income family because everybody's a hard charger and everybody's working really hard for this global goal, which is good. But, but the person, the personal needs are being lost. They're being, they're being missed because the goal is pay the mortgage, pay off the cars, buy the boat, get the lake house. That's the goal. It's not, I need to know you. I want to make sure you're okay. I want to make sure you're, he you're, you're emotionally healthy. I want to make sure that you're feeling, you're, you're feeling what you want to feel as a mom. You're feeling what you want to feel as a dad. Th those things get missed. Yeah. Now, the other thing that's interesting right now, Eric, in the culture we're living in is now, because of this hard charging thing, we've started to get more and more women who are making more money than their husbands. Right. That's a whole new dynamic. So when, when the wife is earning more money 
suddenly the guy is struggling with his value and his worth right off the bat. And that's a whole new can of worms that I don't believe is probably more than maybe a couple 20 years old because, you know, 20 years ago, that just wasn't the case. Right. Now, there are a lot of women that are making more money than their husbands. Right. And these guys, they're, they're struggling. Suddenly becoming house husbands and they, they don't want to be a house husband, but that's the best way to make it work because she's making so much money and his identity is, 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 is at, at risk. He doesn't know who he is. Resentment and bitterness build. And so again, it requires lots of conversation about root issues to get through that. It could work, but it takes a lot of vulnerable conversation. And again, that's what we avoid in the business culture that we live in. Unquantifiable wisdom from, from Jeff Miller. We're gonna we're gonna stop it there. Um there's there's so much more to continue to unpack and maybe we'll get you be fortunate enough to get you back here again and, and and continue to elaborate on this further. So my pleasure. Jeff, thank you so much for this. Thank you for the work that you're doing you're uh in, in my marriage, in the marriages of those that I know close and all the people you're you're serving. Um as I, I hope that I hope that you take this seriously. I hope that you if you are having marital problems, if you're having money issues, uh, intimacy issues, that you you take the time to to work backwards here, slow down. You might need, like we talked about last week, you might need to drop some stuff out of your schedule to make time for each other. And then, if you do that, you you got to ask the deep questions. You have to seek to understand and not seek to to be heard. And if you seek to understand, then you're gonna you're you're on the right track. You there. got it, man. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. And and like we said. This isn't about you subscribing and you uh, you trying to you know increase our likes or anything like that. I don't I don't care about those vanity metrics. But if you are finding value with this, please share it with with others. That way uh, we can get this message out to as many people as need to hear. Love you all. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week. Thank you again for listening to Wealth Well Done. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast player, and together we'll continue to improve our relationship with money and our effectiveness in stewarding it well.